The film had its genesis when uh, Kimberly was a student at Columbia, and we're proud to be able to host this homecoming event uh, for Kimberly and for much of the film's creative team who are here tonight. Uh, please stick around after the screening for a panel discussion with that team. Uh, Writer-director Kimberly Pierce, co-writer Andy Beenan, also a Columbia alum, and Christine Basher on the of a Collider, producers, cinematographer Jim Deneau, editor Lee Percy, casting director Kerry Barton, and actors Chloe Sevigny and Brendan Sexton III. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Columbia Film and Media Studies professor Ron Gregg. Um, the Columbia University School of the Arts is honored to be co-sponsoring this event with the Sundance Institute, and introducing the film on behalf of Sundance is Rachel Chanoff. Rachel is the founder and director of the Office Performing Arts Plus Film, a programming consulting and production company. She is the curator of performing arts and film for the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, director of programming at the Center Series for the 62 Center for Theater and Dance at Williams College, curator of the New York Jewish Film Festival and the Margaret Mead Festival, uh, senior artistic advisor to the Fresh Grass Foundation, and the artistic director of the Brick Celebrate Brooklyn Festival. Perhaps most relevantly, she's a longtime consultant to the feature film and theater programs at the Sundance Institute and was the first Sundance reader of Boys Don't Cry and a great supporter of the film and the filmmakers. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Chanoff. On behalf of Michelle Satter and the whole Sundance Institute, we are just so thrilled and delighted to be part of a celebration of the 20th anniversary of this crucial, groundbreaking, gorgeous film, and also a celebration of Kimberly. So Michelle sent some remarks, as did Domaine Davis, who is a, another Sundance Fellow and a wild fan of Kimberly's. So I'm going to share those remarks with you from Michelle. We had the privilege of supporting Kimberly Pierce in our Screenwriters and Directors Lab in 1997. And at every moment of her experience, we felt her burning desire to bring the tragedy of uh, Brendan, Brandon Tina's life to a film version that would offer audiences a compassionate window into his soul, desire to be accepted and loved and humanity. Before Kimberly, we had never experienced a filmmaker who had such a deep need to question, learn, and become the director who could channel the emotional depth of the real characters in this story. I want, Michelle would like to thank Jack Lechner and Ron Gregg for making this evening possible and including the Sundance Institute in this important event and congratulate Kimberly Pierce and the whole team of artists who brought their commitment, passion, and immense talent to making a landmark film that still deeply resonates today. And from Domaine Davis, a fellow fellow of Kimberly, because uh, at the Sundance Institute, making great art is crucial, but also making community is equally as crucial. Kim Pierce and I call each other movie baby. We met as roommates at the Sundance Labs over 25 years ago when she was there with Boys Don't Cry and I was there with Lyft. In between filming and editing scenes, creative advisor meetings, eating Triscuits with melted cheddar, and dancing to You Spin Me Right Around at 2 a.m., we decided that our movies were our babies. The lab was like sending them to school. One day they would grow up and move out of the house, get distribution, and march off into the world without us speaking for them. We decided we do, would do this again and again as we both planned on having a lots of babies. So congratulations, move, Movie Baby, on your first turning, turning 20 years old. Love always, Movie Baby. So, we're so honored to have been a little part of the inception of this amazing work of art, Kimberly Pierce. Hey guys. Uh, uh, I'm going to keep this short. I don't uh, normally speak before the movie because I want you just to, to relate to it, but uh, on this occasion I actually did want to say a, a few things. Uh, first of all, Sundance played a huge part uh, of my education and my becoming an artist and this movie that I, I love actually like a movie baby, um, so thank you. Uh, Columbia has been a profound experience. I just taught you guys for four hours. Uh, ready to keep going. That was great. Uh, and I cannot wait that afterwards you guys are going to get to hear um, from my amazing collaborative team, which uh, is the reason that this movie exists. Um, the one thing that I have noticed, so, you know, for the last 20 years I've been all over the place talking about this movie and uh, afterwards, you know, we, we go in depth on the making of, 
what I've noticed that I think is kind of profound is here we are 20 years later, and I think most people uh, of a certain age don't realize how different the world was when we made this movie. Uh, and I don't want to tax the situation, but I do want to say, when I was coming of age in New York, I mean, it was 94. We ran out when the Village Voice, you know, hit the stands at 3 a.m., and we found out what the hell was going on in the city. But that's not happening now. We barely had internet. I mean, we would dial up and you got knocked off if somebody called you. <laughs> and in particular, when you're going to meet this extraordinary human being, uh, Brandon Tina, who I love dearly, Try to imagine the, the power of this person's desire to be who they are and what they had around them to figure out who they were. Um, you know, we had extraordinary things here to help us figure out who we were, but we were kind of in the, the cultural cutting edge. And just imagine this kid. And uh, that's all I want to say. And I am really moved almost to tears. So thank you. to tell, and I met with Rachel, um, and I met with Michelle Satter, and they were stunning because they understood uh, how passionate I was about the story and offered uh, the greatest support, and uh, that's to bring me into the whole Filmmakers uh, Institute and Lab, and uh, my education here was tremendous, and, and Sundance really took it to the next level. And then there's Chloe. Hi. Oh my God. <laughs> And Chloe, as you know, is an extraordinary actress, and uh, what a performance. So we will talk more about that. But uh, she tried out for Brandon, so she could have played both roles. And my god. So I'll just say briefly, um, uh, Chloe had the part, and you know, the real Lana was a particular person, very specific, and uh, I had very little rehearsal time, and I flew back, and we were having a read-through, and uh, Carrie's the one that fought for you so good um and we had a read through and chloe walked in and she was lana and it was amazing that you walked into that room and just blew all of us away and we only had i think three and a half days to rehearse it and you were just extraordinary and the first scene that we shot was the jail scene and really just had so defi defined it so beautifully and then there's christine vachon By the time I met Christine, because I met Christine when I was developing it as a short film, uh, I was dating Nicole Eisenman, who introduced me to Christine, and I came in and we looked at my dailies for my short film. Actually, it's Rose who, Rose Trochet, okay. introduced you. Great. Right. <laughs> Give credit to Rose. So it's Rose, Nicole. Uh, I was very lucky, and I had made a short, came in, and Christine by that point already was, you know, a really uh, sophisticated and very established. Uh, producer, so I was very lucky to come in and meet Christine. I was here in, in film school and I had made a short and we both looked at the footage and said, well, we should make it into a feature, but we shouldn't use that footage. And then it was many, many years when we can talk about that. And it was, you know, her astute guidance. And uh, I can always thank you for getting rid of the father. <laughs> and now there's Carrie Barton, who is a tremendous casting director. And we said to Carrie Barton, we have to find this person. And Carrie pulled out all the stops, and we can get more into the details, but for three years, before there was any money behind the project, I paid for everything. And I had looked at, um, I had traveled with Transsexual Menace, uh, a group of uh, self-named trans, they, at, at, back in the day, we would say the word transsexual. Now you don't, but that is what we said, and it was respectful. Um, now you say trans people. But Transsexual Menace, that was a self-named activist group who I traveled to the murder 
trial with and uh, interviewed Kate Bornstein and Tony Barreto Neto and a number of trans people all about Brandon and we began the, I began the casting process in grad school. So I was looking at trans people, I was looking at butches, I was looking at, at everybody. And then Carrie picked up and, you know, really just pulled out all the stops and, and fought for every one of the cast. Um, I was young, you know, I didn't know a lot. So uh, mm -hmm. it was great to have so many experts. And then Jeff Sharp, I always love this story that we've been trying for years to get the movie made and uh, Christine might remember it differently, but I had been to Amsterdam where like people smoked all the time and they were you know, smoking galois, you couldn't even breathe. <laughs> and Christine had said, well, you're gonna go and you sell the movie. And you know, I was like, okay. And so I just started talking about the movie and everybody would always say, that's such a fascinating story. Who's gonna direct it? <laughs> and I was like, me. But obviously I was in grad school. Nobody was gonna hire me to do that. Um, and then at some point the movie had fallen apart two or three times and Christine called me up and said, oh, we got financing for the second time. And I was like, who? And it was the guys down the hall. <laughs> so it, it was Jeff, Jeff Sharp and John Hart, and they were going to come in and finance the movie. And that was a dream come true. And that after it falling apart two or three times, that really was, it was happening, but it was hard to know if it was really happening. Um, so you guys were extraordinary. And then there's the amazing Lee Percy. Um, so. <laughs> I mean, I'm lucky. Everybody on this panel really is one of the greats. Um, and I was lucky, really, they, they are. You are so lucky, and I was so lucky, that Christine helped me bring together such brilliant people because I had a dream and a passion, and I was at this great school and going to Columbia, and I was determined to do the work, but I didn't have the experience. So we moved to Lee Percy, who had already cut two Oscar-winning performances. I don't want to, right. So they were Kissing the Spider Woman, or what, what were they? Kiss of the Spider Woman was one, and uh, Reversal of Fortune. Yes, Jeremy Irons. Jeremy Irons. So two fantastic performances. So we were very fortunate because I really shouldn't say this publicly, and I was going to wait till I retire. But the first cut was four and a half hours. <laughs> I mean, I haven't said it publicly, but this isn't really public, uh, and that's completely a crime. And Christine kept saying you know, you have to cut it down, and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. They would call the editing room, and yeah, 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 yeah. Because I was like, if it's four and a half, and we released it at like three and a half, that's really a, that's great. And then at some point, Christine said, which was great, Kim, it's not a movie. And I was like, what do you mean? It's, it's a movie. People come, and they watch it, and they take a pee break, and it's fine. And she was like, but it doesn't move. It's not moving. And I didn't know what that meant until we started pulling stuff out, and when that thing started to move, I was like, oh my god, it's moving. So, it took a lot for everybody to deal with somebody who, I, I actually would have been fine with the 45 version. I'm glad it's not, but great performance, uh, editor, great perform uh, acting editor, just everything. <coughs> really fantastic. And Eva Kolodner, who actually, I just feel like it's like a game show. Uh, <laughs> this is your life. Um, Eva Kolodner, who read every damn script and was always calling me, again, we didn't have... Well, you had voice, you didn't, you didn't have voicemail, you had your message machine, and I would, I would see that Eva had called. No, I wouldn't even see it, I would hear it. Where's the script? What's happening with the script? So the script took forever, and she read every single draft and gave brilliant, brilliant notes. And then Andy Beenan, uh, my buddy. <laughs> We've been friends for, I hate to say 30 years, because I'm not that old, but uh, again. Tremendous, uh, and I'll tell you what was interesting, uh, we can get to it uh, kind of later, but you know, it was important, I think in a way, to have Andy's point of view on what this character was, given that I had been to the murder trial and I had interviewed all the real people and I was just swimming in all the, the real material. And for a while there was too much real material, which we can all talk about why real stories are hard, but then in a way that we swung the other way and there was too little. So I remember that was kind of a, a big thing. And this boy. <laughs> the boy! <laughs> Brandon Sexton was somebody that I had in mind to cast from the very beginning. From that great movie you did. What is it? Yes. It was so brilliant. And we can get into it, but we had uh, a couple moments when he wasn't sure, should we say? Well, when we were doing the rape scene, uh, they said uh, Sexton's missing. And I said, oh boy, because you know you have like five hours to shoot these scenes and you don't want to hear that your actor's gone missing. And then you, you don't know what you're going to do. And so I went and can I say? 
it, they said he's crying. And I just, I didn't, I, you know, I was very upset and didn't quite know what to do, but we knew, I had, we'd all rehearsed and worked out this scene and I went and met with him and he said something kind of profound and he was said, I don't want to do the scene um, because I'm, I, you can, maybe you'll tell, you'll tell us what you said to me. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> I, uh, I just remember, like, oh, tell um, us, yeah. I just, uh, well, mm. This is the first time I saw the movie in 20 years because it's really tough to watch. And, uh, the bathroom scene really got to me watching it this time. And, uh, I, the way I remember is we, we did one take and I couldn't commit to it. So the stunt coordinator who's in the movie had to pull me aside and said, Hillary's ready. And, um, you don't want to keep the lead actor waiting, someone who's like dedicating their all to it and um, is making themselves so open and vulnerable and available. And uh, so then we did the scene and then, yes, I went missing because I, I, I just couldn't do it anymore. And I just cried for, I don't know, 45 minutes and then we were behind that dairy factory or whatever it was. And <coughs> I just remember my I was like loud sobbing, like primal guttural sobs, just echoing off like this rusted industry. And um, and then Kim came over and talked to me and told me it was good I was crying, you know. Um, you remember that? Because boys don't cry, right? Because <laughs> that, that was part of uh, our analysis of people like Tom. Um, was that? They, they didn't have a venue for their feelings, so Tom was someone who took it out on himself. He burned himself, he cut himself, and then uh, Brandon became um, an object he could unleash his uh, feelings upon. And so Kim told me it was good that I'm crying and that I should be because that is me connecting to my humanity. Something like that, right? Something like that. Um, and so I think then, I also said, yeah. because you cried, you were the act, the kind of actor, or the you were the actor that I wanted to play the role. Had you not cried and not been sensitive to how powerful representation of violence against another human being and rape was, I didn't even understand it, but I should have been suspicious. But the fact that you cried, it was a dilemma, but then the problem is the solution. It actually, you taught me something about the role that I wanted from right, a heterosexual man who was playing that role. Thank you. And you said one more thing, do you remember? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I, was, I was amazed it's been 20 years that you remember that. 23 years. Um, you said, I don't want to hurt Hillary. And what did I say? I remember. You tell me. I said, you should tell Hillary that. And so he went to Hillary because it was important that they communicate. And he said, I don't want to hurt you. Do you remember what she said? Um, no, it's okay. That's why you're here. It was a dark night. What am I doing? Um, well, it was interesting. He, he showed her humility. He said, I don't want to hurt you. And she said, you have to. For, you, you can't hold back for Brandon. You have to just go for it. I can take care of myself. I'll be okay. And so you all gave each other permission. And really for me, because we had worked so hard on it, you brought such humility and emotion and, and the kind of sensitivity that, that, that I didn't realize I wanted, but I wanted. You then showed that towards her. She then fed it back to you. And really that night, I mean, you, we were all there. I just remember really standing back because I had done so much thinking and deep meditating on it. And you guys brought out, like when I watch it still, I just break down crying because of the honesty that you guys brought. So. And Jim Deneau. The brilliant cinematographer who, <laughs> we can thank Christine for another great choice. Uh, I had talked to Jim early on, and we had a great time. I'll hand you my mic. Um, I'll take my mic. Okay. So, <laughs> so, I'm intimidated by this thing. Me too. Uh, I don't know what the world is like now, but I, back then, it was a really small community. Um, I was up here, it was like there was a handful of cinematographers that we knew of. Christine was great, you know, we really respected her. I had been talking to you on my own. 
I really liked you. I don't know if you weren't available or what happened, but we ended up going with somebody else. Oh, it's a really interesting story, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, as, as long as it's kosher and you can... Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll hand it over to you. But I, we okay. had met when it was your... We were talking about it when it was your grad film, and then somehow... Oh, okay, my short. Yeah, when it yeah. was your short. Great. And, you know, and then I think something came up like I got a job that paid and I had to pay some bills. And so wait, that was the thing back then is right. So when I was doing a short, I would meet all the great people, but then ultimately they never could do it when you were doing right. a short because you weren't paying them. So yes, I, I had, lost the great guy. Right. I had shot a bunch of, of Columbia um, student films. Um, Amy Talkington, I shot like three mm -hmm. films for her and, um, and Christy Hasen and a couple other people. So that and that, I think that was how I met you the first time, was through that sort of network. And then, um, then you know, but I couldn't shoot your grad film. And then you called me back, like, a year or so <laughs> later, and said, well, okay, now I've written a feature-length script, and we're, you know, we're getting it going again. So I, you know, I met you a couple times, and, you know, saw drafts of the script as it was going. And then, so, I, you know, I shot Catherine Diekman's movie, and, in Asheville, North Carolina. This was in the spring of, of 98. And then I got a phone call for, uh, you know, to meet a director in Los Angeles. So I went there and met her and, you know, liked the script. And, you know, Lisa and Skyler, who did Getting to Know You. And so I was scheduled to, you know, I, I signed on to do that in, um, I think it was July of 2019. And when I got home, I, you know, I literally got home from the trip, you know, saying yes to that movie. And there was a message on my answering machine saying, "Hey, this is uh, this is Jill over at the production office, and I just wanted to follow up." And I was like, "Who is this? What production office? This isn't this isn't the person I know." So I called the number that they left, and you know, it was Jill Footlick, who was the line producer, and um, she was saying, "Yeah, this is from Kim's movie," and I was like. Wait, where did when when did Kim's movie come come in? It's like, well, we've been talking to your agent, whose name I will redact here. Um, the, and it was an agent that I had actually fired like six months before because they were so disorganized and you know and like not a very good you know. I, I was like, why am I paying this person to do this? And so then I called him and gave you know gave him peace of my mind. He was like, well, yeah, you don't want to do this movie. It's like, it's like I've been no, I've been talking to her for five years. <laughs> And you know now we're finally doing it. So by that point, I was already committed to this other film. I couldn't do it. I had to say, you know, unfortunately, sorry. And so then they, I, I don't know what happened on your side of the story. I went off in shock getting to know you. And during the last week of getting to know you, I get a phone call. And it's like, yeah, this is so-and-so from the production office of a movie. And our director of photography, we're in prep. And our director of photography had a family emergency, has to go somewhere. And I was like, when, when would you need me to start? It's like, tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and I said, no, I'm busy until next Saturday or something like that. I, like, I'm committed to this movie right now. I'm working. And, you know, and then 15 minutes later, I get a phone call, and it's Eva, who I had known from another project. And she's like, OK, that was us. And <laughs> we're, we're um, you know, and so I ended up leaving directly from one movie to the other movie. We, Kim and I prepped for like 13 days, and then we started shooting, and that was, that's the story of that. And it was, I, I do want to co compliment, I mean, all these people, and specifically Jim, to work with a first-time director and have done a number of movies and be hit with that script, which, while it looked like 120 pages, once you <laughs> accounted for the fact that we had changed the font and changed the margins, <laughs> was it 140 or 150? Yeah. So they said to me, we took your script and we put it on the Warner Brothers, the, the rack. And I was like, well, what does that mean? Like, I don't understand why you would do that to my script. And they were like, your script is like 150 pages. And I was like, okay, it's a big story. Not okay. Um, so many of all of you people did miracles, but I mean, specifically with Jim, it just meant insane amounts of shooting. I mean, even when you look now, a number of five or six person scenes are shot in one shot. Um, you were having to do 360 lighting. I mean, if you want to talk about any of the craziness of it, that that just making it happen. So, I, I was telling Kim this story. What? Be, shooting, shooting at night. I kept. I can't watch that bumper, the the truck bumper thing, without saying sun's coming up. 
And there were shots we couldn't use because it was getting too light. Yeah. yeah. Peter said the nicest the thing to me that night. Like, all right, so the story of that night is that we had, you know, a light up on a big boom lift and there was we had police officers who were controlling traffic on the road near where we were shooting. And the shift changed for the cops. And the new cop coming in said, no, that lift can't be there. It has to be on the other side of the road, which meant, you know, w there wasn't even a place to park it over there. Not to, you know, so we were doing some stuff that would be, you know, OSHA would shut us down these days. But to get the, we had to move the lift over, move the cable over. And while we're waiting for all this to happen, which took close to an hour, the assistant director is telling me the story about how, um, you know, when she was a student at Columbia College in Chicago, the other Columbia Film School, um, boo. Yeah, boo. <laughs> just, but that was your cue. They, um, she, um, she was the sound person on a movie that Janusz Kaminski shot when they were doing the student film, and she covered the generator with furniture pads that caught on fire, and there were no lights. And so, and you know, he said, so he lit it with just like a car headlight, and I was like, well, was he happy about it? And that, you know, that was the end of the story. Scott Miller, who is the gaffer, is here tonight, and he probably remembers that in more gruesome detail than, uh, you know, than, than I do. But how did we get off on the story? Oh, so Peter said the nicest thing to me. He said, all my favorite movies have the sky turning blue in the background. He said, Blade Runner, Touch of Evil. It, the, all my favorite movies, the sky is turning blue. And, you know, it made me feel better. Even tonight, watching that scene again feel better. Yeah. I have to say, I think, I think we've done three movies together at least, yes. and Jim is great at, at, especially in this one, of like picking up coverage in one shot and managing it like in one take to get pieces that you can cut out and suddenly have a close-up and suddenly you have a two shot. So we managed to uh, pull a couple of scenes together with very little footage. Well, that Eva, at the beginning, you know, I got the script in the mail, like FedEx, when I was in, on location on, on the movie before. And, you know, it was a pretty fat envelope. And, um, you know, she said, I, I think the script is long. And I said, yeah. And, and, um, and she said, well, what do you think we could take out? And I was like, you know, that's not really my role, and I don't really even know how to do that. And she said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, we'll shoot as much of it as we can, as well as we can, and then they'll figure it out in the edit. <laughs> Get to the edit first. I want to ask Chloe a question, and then I uh, get to Lee. So, Chloe, yeah, if you're okay about getting inside, uh, you just were so extraordinary. I don't know how comfortable you are talking about any of your process, but when I first met you, what was amazing was I had interviewed the real Lana, and I had a videotape, and you were so brilliant. You said, "I don't want to try to be her. I don't want to copy her." So I don't know if I want to look at the tape. You said something like that, um, and I thought that was really right. And yet I wanted to find a way that it was both her and you, that there was a synthesis of the two of you. Um, just, just anything you want to share with us just about the experience of doing it. You're so, you really are a lot of people's way in, because I've been lecturing about it, and that's what people often say, is like, you're their eyes, you're their way of understanding the story. Well, I feel like I was really trying to mimic her a lot. I mean, just <laughs> from the photos, I remember just like looking at these photos and being so obsessed with like, Brandon swag and like just how like I don't know how he owned it and was like I was in love with him just by looking at these photos and in love with them and their love story and just her eyes like that kind of like half lidded just <coughs> meditating on these photos of her and how like beautiful she was and they were and you know that's like they were criminals, and it was so sexy, and <laughs> I was so enthralled, and um, yeah, I remember she wanted like Julia Roberts to play her or something, I was like, oh shit, <laughs> she's never going to be happy with me. <laughs> there was something profound when I met uh, the, the, I don't like to say the real, but the, the, the person it was based on, and uh, when I first met her, because we always thought that part of the key of the script was when did she know that Brandon was a female-bodied person. So when I first met her, back then you used the term girl, now you would say female body person, but that's, we said girl. And I said, when did you know Brandon was a girl? And she said, oh, I always knew Brandon was a girl. And I said, oh God, we don't have a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, okay, so you always knew Brandon was a girl? And she's like, no, I didn't know until they stripped him. 
And I said, so you didn't know until I showed them? No, I didn't know. So, and this was a big screenwriting issue. It was, okay, if you have a character who is an unreliable narrator, you have to figure out, I thought that again we had a problem, but oftentimes I've learned in, in creativity that the problem is the solution. In fact, the fact that she had a shifting understanding of Brandon and whether he was or was not what the society needed them to be versus what she felt. It, that was the thing that we had to be very careful in those scenes that you were inside her desire for Brandon this human and that she was going in and out of acknowledging or knowing that this was a female bodied person and weighing how important that was to her. I'm curious what But that he was also like an escape for her and she was projecting so much onto him and you know and she's recounting their first, you know, make out or whatever, and she's leaving bits out and making stuff up, and you know, she's, you know, kind of making up her own story. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> oh, it just—it's—it's it's just so wonderful to to hear from you. And Christine, do you want to jump in and add anything? What uh, to uh, that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, not to that. To any of it. It's been such a great journey, you know. Uh, you got to give me a little bit more direction. <laughs> okay, well, how about this? I, when I first met you, I think what was great was you were so passionate to tell the story. I was so passionate to tell the story. And I remember you had said, oh, we could probably do it for $200,000. And I had a short film, and I thought, $200,000, that's like millions and billions of dollars. Um, so you sent me to um, Amsterdam. I'm just curious. You're I, looking... think, I think I probably sent you to Rotterdam. Yes, Rotterdam. Uh, because Amsterdam <laughs> would probably have just been. I you went to, to Amsterdam to drink beer and, oh, my and smoke pot. Uh, I thought I went to Rotterdam. Actually, had there was a method to there was a cinema art exactly. So so exactly. Uh, you know what I remember is actually we when we first looked together at at the footage you shot for your short film. We tried to use that footage to uh, um, to convince people that there was a feature in that, mm. and we went to a lot of different people with it. Um, I, I remember when we first met. What I what I I think what I did was I actually paid to get your movie out of hock from Duart. Yes, uh, which hawk, hawk, hawk. Uh, uh, Eva is is, is yeah. nodding. And I think I did it personally. To get the film because you just said Ro I trust Rose, and this sounds yeah. like an interesting story. Right, yeah. right. And I probably did it personally because we didn't have company money. Right. We didn't have a company. We didn't have a company. <laughs> so, Sorry. Uh, so we tried with the and and I thought the the footage was 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 strong, but but you know it's still a student film. And and I think after trying that, you know, showing it to a number of, of potential financiers, uh, it just was like, you know what, we just, just should throw that all away and start all over again and say, this is going to be something, you know, uh, that will, that a potential financier could be a part of. And it's not like there's already something that's, and, and that was also, remember, and this is something I think is is also interesting. Originally, you wrote the the script before Andy, um, without using Brandon's name or Lana's name. Right. I because I was scared that there was going to be life Absolutely. rights issues. Absolutely. Right. I feel like, but I feel like it was a big breakthrough when we said to you, just, yes, just embrace what really happened. Well, we that was spend so like two. We spent a good long time trying to just write yeah. scenes around what you had already done, right? And right, make right. it as a film, yeah. added on to that short film. Yeah, and there that's was such a right. major breakthrough moment of like that was we were. It's not going to work. It was kind of like having your foot in cement. We were yeah. stuck with that short. <laughs> right. We threw it out. But I, I had been told I would never get the life rights. I shouldn't name the person yeah. by the real names. So I had gone away from real details. You no, know, we yeah. all. I mean, we all. Were, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not saying that was. You know your your uh, you know particular walk down yeah. a path that didn't. It was all of us. I mean, and, and then we liberating. all changed path at a certain point, and it was uh, enormously liberating. It was great. What gave you or us the confidence to go back to? Because once we went back to the real story, because I had ten thousand pages of transcripts, I had been to the murder trial. I, I think I think it was that. I think it was. Uh, and Eva, you may remember differently, but I think it was actually like the the 
we started developing it with you, then they went on trial, and then I think we helped you go to Nebraska. I, I may be wrong, but I think we you know, augmented that we, you were like, I gotta do this. We were like, you absolutely do. Yeah, went like three times. And, um, and I think we started to realize while you were there that like, this was not anybody's property. This was what was actually It was happening. in the public domain. And, um, and then while you were there, you were like, I'm getting court transcripts. I'm, I'm looking at this. And then, of course, you were also talking to Lana. Yes, I was talking to the real Lana guy. I interviewed with the real Lana, interviewed with the real mom. And I, and you got Lana's life rights. Yes, I got Lana's life rights. I was in the room and I said, you know, I want to make this movie. I'm, you know, I'm in grad school. And then, you know, who do you want to play you? And that's why you saw that tape. Um, and then I said, you know, is it okay? And she said, yes. And then she signed and we filmed it. So we had that, which was smart. But by going to the murder trial, by going and meeting the mother, and I had conjectured that the mother gave away where the, that they were at the, at the farmhouse. So uh, Norman Mailer says that if you read enough history that you begin to get inside of it and you can begin to conjecture what might have happened. So I, in the script, we had written that the mother said they're out at the farmhouse. And then when I interviewed the mother, she's like, oh yeah, I told them that Brandon was out to the farmhouse. So those interviews became kind of crazy. They were all on video. Um, but you're right, the real story was so rich and it was a, a very classic tragedy with five characters. Like, it was just so ripe. So every time we went back to the real story and we transformed it, it you, you didn't want to write something different. So that was a bold move that, that you did and that we did. I do remember Kim calling one day and saying, Christine says we can call him Brandon, you know, and it was like, it's very it's amazing. He was Sloss, who like, we oh, was it Sloss? Sloss, and he was oh, like, lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. The you lawyer. Know. The lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you needed that. I mean, look, it, it just, we've done a lot of true life stories since then, and we've done one or two before then, and I think, there's two liberations. There's the liberation saying we can call him Brandon, and then there's the liberation where you say, but it doesn't actually have to be exactly the way it happened. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was a big thing. Once, once we were saying it's Brandon, it's Lana, etc., you had to go over another home and say, all right, but now I have to if I'm using the real names, I also have to deal with the fact that um, uh, there's, you know, there's license I'm taking for narrative license I'm taking to make it a better movie. And well, you had to in order to, to get the the beginning, middle, and end of that story working. You had to then again distill the underlying emotional truth. Right. So you had to both attach to the the truth and then change. Well, I was just going to say in editing, we talked about capturing the spirit of Brandon. Right. That, that, that was really what the film was doing. We had to do screenings where we actually said, what do you like and not like about a particular performance? And you get those notes back and, you know, you're, you're trying to figure it out. That was a four and a half hour cut. Three and a half hour cut. <laughs> hey, I admitted to it, guys. <laughs> I never have. Um, Carrie, you want to talk about... Well, actually, before I move on from Christine, when you look back now, I'm amazed that we got it made. I mean, I think you were the only person who could have made it that way. I think we were the only people, all of us, in New York at that time. It was a kind of energy around filmmaking, a kind of clarity. I mean, you know, I watch it and it's so clear and authentic. I'm still amazed that we got it done. But I would, I would take this moment then to give real credit to Jeff and John Hart. Great. Because I... Uh, Actually, Jeff, what I remember oh, good. is that you guys had, you were about to um, finance You Can Count on Me, That's Kenny right. Lonergan's movie, mm -hmm. and then that fell apart for some reason, and I was like, I have a movie, <laughs> I have a movie. But it was, it was, um, it was so organic at that point, and first of all, we were Columbia together, so yeah. we were part of the same community. Um, and there was that sense of familiarity and recognition, and we were friends. And you would come into our office mm -hmm. and print out the script, the however many hundred page <laughs> script that there was at that time. And I'd be like, hey, Kim, and we, we just, we started hanging out, and it became, when, when that conversation started, as much as I'd like to, be, we financed the film, it was, <coughs> we joined the cause, and, and, and really, you know, became part of the, the group effort to get the film made. And there was no plan in the beginning, honestly. I mean, 
it was my second movie. So I, I, I don't think there was like a financing plan. It's just we realized that we all had to, to get this movie made together. But I think we all can say first money in is a big deal, right? Until somebody takes it. So he's saying it was a group effort. Yes, it was, and you're being humble about it. But <coughs> my instinct is, and you were more on the front lines than me because I was making it, but I think that first money in was the big leap, right? We didn't have first money in up until then. Well, I mean, you say first money in, it's like the money to actually, I mean, it was the only money. <laughs> <laughs> first last anything. It yes. did run out. out. It she did. Up. Yes. <laughs> no, the money ran out, and then uh, IFP, IFC showed up. We're all standing around like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> it was, okay. The people missing up here is Jonathan Siri. Right. Yes, but he now runs IFC. But, but truth be told, I was going to direct a sex scene, and they said they're going to mic you. And I was like, why are they going to mic me? Because I wasn't sleeping at all. And they were like, well, because they're going to film you. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. I don't understand. And they were like, well, we sold the movie. We got a million dollars. I was like, okay. I was like, we got a million dollars. Like, again, a million dollars is a billion dollars to me. I was like, we are rich. And they were like, no, we were going to shut you down. Uh, and we didn't, we were going to shut you down. We just didn't want to tell you that because you wouldn't keep working the way you were working. So then we got that extra money and we still didn't have enough money. But first money in is, is really, again, first, you know, it was really bold of them to do that. And then Carrie Barton, who, again, it's so great that these guys were, everybody was such pros. Um, the task of putting this cast together, and, and I now, I'll admit it, he, there were a couple times that they argued with me and they were right. Um, and I, I'm lucky. So <laughs> we collaborated, <laughs> as opposed to arguing actually. Um, but uh, I got I got the script from Christine, and then I saw the Sundance short that you made, and thought it was really good. Um, not quite as phenomenal as I think what I saw in the script. And uh, Christine suggested a few books that I read as well. Do you remember that? No. Yeah. One was a, a, a Stonebridge Blues. Mm -hmm. oh, Stuff like that. Uh, factory worker in upstate New York. There you and, go. Stonebridge uh, Blues. Yeah. Good for so you. I read those, and um, we started getting VCR tapes from all over the country. We we must have gotten, I don't know, 300 VCR tapes of people putting themselves on tape that were interested in the project, and we started the casting process as well and saw everybody that wanted to come in for this, which was a massive amount of people. I was really... Over three years. Three, yeah, three years, though. Three years going on for this project. And Chloe came in a million times, it felt like. <laughs> and... Uh, no, the views only for every other independent movie. Happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wait, no, wait. It just seemed like I was always there. <laughs> do, wait, do you remember? Wait, do you, Chloe would not come in as Lana. Yeah. So I was in Texas, and Chloe had come in as Brandon, and we had looked high and low for this perfect girl, and we could not, you would think that would be the easy role, we could not find this person, and I was told, Chloe Sevigny will do Lana, and I was like, okay, great, so she can audition, and I'll see it, da da da, -da. she's not going to audition. Yeah. I was like, what do you mean she's not going to audition, I don't well, understand. The agents always tell you not to audition, because then you won't get the part. Okay, they were like, she's not, they, they were like, she's not going to audition, and I was like, then she can't have the role, and they were like, well, we think you should give her the role, because she's the best actress, and she's right, and blah, 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 and I was like, for real? So, I was not happy that That was would, one of our arguments. Yes, that was an argument, because I was so precious, but they said, she's great, she can do this, so I actually studied all your movies, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and you were brilliant. For all Christine's movies. Yes. <laughs> but it, we sort of felt, we kind of felt like Chloe was ours. <laughs> Chloe's all of ours. <laughs> so it was interesting. It was a, many things were wonderful about what you did, but there's a moment in Last Days of Disco at the Which very I also end. Did. What? Yeah. <laughs> at the very end, she pours into the subway. Uh, you're in the train, and you just start kind of dancing. And it was like intoxicating how sexual and like just open and easy and, and fluid. And it was also something that you would see in an independent film, not in a, a Hollywood feature. And it was like you captivated the audience and you gave us something and you took it away. And that was, I was like, I, we'll do it. And we, I took the risk, but then when, that's why when you showed up, we were all like this. You were just, you had become her. Yeah, for me, for me the, the movie is supported by Chloe's performance. Because it really does. I mean, it's it's you can't have in casting. You have to have get everything perfect, and um, and Chloe is the perfection in that movie. I think 
Um, we saw a zillion people, it felt like. And, um, and one day I was in LA and working on a big budget film. And at lunch, I decided to put some people on tape. And it was um, uh, Peter Sarsgaard went on tape in LA on my lunch hour. And Janetta Arnett, who plays your mother. And um, one other actor that came from those tapes that I sent to <coughs> Oh, Oh, Hillary. Hillary came in. <laughs> and then, you know. When Peter, I don't know if anybody remembers, but Peter was very skinny. He was from Mississippi. He was a sweet Southern boy. Yep. And the issue I had was he's so wonderful and needs love, which is perfect, but he's not scary. He was not scary when we met him. And that was something that if you look at each of you, you all, I don't think people realize this, they all radically transformed. They became just other versions of themselves. There was many, many discussions with Kim about their, because I'd seen, I mean, with Chloe and with a lot of these actors, I've seen them come in for multiple auditions, so I know what their depth of talent is, um, more than just seeing them do an audition for a specific film. So that's a good thing to be able to discuss with a director, and Casper, and then several times, I think, as well. And um, so it was a good it was a good group of family people that were playing these horrible people. <laughs> yeah, it was like, ah. um, but, but they were so but, committed. Yeah, yeah they each were of so you committed. Came with such commitment that I feel that's it. Just brought out uh, you you all, you both brought stuff to it that like I, we we couldn't have written. And I actually knew Hillary from um, an audition for Last Days of Disco that she didn't get. <laughs> mm -hmm. I so. think that we were all just like your you know your commitment to the material and to Brendan. I, I, Brand and like we just we all wanted to serve you. I mean, that's what I remember the most. Don't you? I, I think so too. I, I don't think it's been over 20 years. I don't think I've worked on a more well researched film since. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Kimberly probably was the foremost authority on Brandon Tino. Um, I, I, she had me reading court transcripts. Yep, I, I gave you guys a huge packet that was this big of, yeah. I and think I, it was I court transcripts, the articles, I read, everything. I read them all, uh, more than once, and you had me um, watch documentaries, et cetera, et cetera. So as an actor, you you want a director to inspire you and yeah. and so that and then and you also want those pats on the head you know you're, I was 18 when we shot that oh, so yeah. I'm, I'm just a little boy like desperate for validation and so you know uh, I'll, did, I do, did I do good Ms. Director <laughs> <laughs> so but you made us want to rise to the occasion so I agree with what Chloe said we could not. It was like this level. We had to. We well, all had to rise. Yes. We, we had to, yeah. Well, they all pushed each other and they all became a little, which was kind of beautiful that's happened on a couple of my movies. And then we'll take a question. I love that you guys all became your own, like, club. You know what I mean? Like, they would, I, I, you know what I do remember? There were a couple times you were like, Kim, how come you never party with us? Why don't you go out drinking? Which is like, we had no time to sleep, no time to do anything. <laughs> do you remember when we were shooting? You must remember this. We were shooting the murder scene. And they're supposed to drive up in the car, yeah. and and I remember, I was standing in the in the road, and you guys didn't stop, right? And we were like, "What's going? Why didn't they stop?" Yeah, you want to say why? Because Peter probably told me, "No, just keep going; it'll be funny." <laughs> <laughs> or there was a little drinking like involved. Yeah, there was a little drinking. <laughs> anyway, so there was, a, there was more than a little drinking. Involved. <laughs> uh, Peter. Peter. Christine doesn't know that. None of the adults. No, that we're indemnifying them. We're indemnifying them. They don't know about the whippets. They don't know about the wine. They don't know about anything. Yeah, one of those the candlewood sweet stays. Exactly. Peter was so drunk. Uh, he was. I was so drunk that I let him leave me. Uh, that he was grabbing me and we were walking onto the character Candace's porch and he smacked me into the pole. I remember. And, and I was so disappointed in myself that I broke character and said, Al. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how tuned up you had. Like, I was upset at myself. Invested. Remember he was like growing up during tent scenes and he was really... Oh, he was through the, he was moment? put himself through the ringer. Oh, Peter threw up. He was, the yeah. Scene. yeah. But also, wasn't he just shaking in a mess? Like, he just was beautiful. He was hyperventilating. Yeah. 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 And then, Alicia also broke down during that scene as well. She had a cry session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
something about how you discovered Hillary and working with her and what that was all like. Uh, sure. Uh, and again, these people all, which is so great, it's, you know, a movie is all its, its, its parts. Um, but we did know that we needed to find a human being who could bring Brain and Tina to life. And I had, um, just to put it quickly, I had fallen deeply in love with Brandon the night I read the article in the Village Voice. It was three in the morning, I was at a law firm. I felt like I had adopted a child. I walked out of there, told Andy, told everybody at film school, I need to make this movie. Within about a week, you know, about two weeks, I had found The Transsexual Menace, and that was a group of uh, activist transsexuals. I traveled with them. I was researching them. I always knew that I, you know, I was living a, a very queer life. We wouldn't even use the term queer back then. We would have said a gay life. Um, and at that time, I think people don't realize, but I call myself a dyke, but you would have called me a lesbian, and I had a lot of what you would call lesbian friends, and there wasn't a lot of mixing of what we would have called lesbians and trans people. There was a, a pretty big separation in my social group, um, but because I didn't know what Brandon was, I wanted to interview trans people and, and butches, and we really thought we would find, again, you don't use the term queer, but we thought we would find either a trans person or a butch, certainly a, what you would call a gay person back then, um, and so immediately, and I was in grad school and on my own dime just started interviewing people and taping people. And I have the drag king calendar with me. We brought in all the hot drag kings. Uh, I know Ilsa Joel was a big favorite. Um, she looks like Superman. Uh, and these were female body people who identified as females but did dr and did drag, which meant that they went on stage and they performed masculinity. Now whether they were actually trans or not, it's, it doesn't, it, it's a different, it, they might be, it doesn't necessarily, it isn't so. So we did all that. Um, and we had a lot of trans people come in, Harry Dodge, um, Silas Howard, who I believe at that point, and I don't want to speak for them, I think they identified as butch lesbians, butch, and now are, I think, identifying as trans men again. I don't want to speak for them, I'm just saying within a range. So there was a, a, a journey that a lot of people took. So those people auditioned, um, and you didn't get any straight people, because at that point playing gay was a dangerous thing to do. My, under, my feeling about the time was when Ellen came out, I felt like that's when we had cisgendered uh, women coming in and they wanted to play the part. And it was really interesting because they would be like, they'd come in with a sock in their pants and their hair pulled back and they would be like, hi. And I was like, okay, we gotta like lower your sexuality. We just gotta get it in there and we gotta like stud you out. And you could just see they like had never been talked to that way. And so there was a kind of, it's like they got an erection, like getting excited but they really couldn't transition into the masculine of centeredness. That's the term we would use now. So I had all these straight girls who loved the part and wanted to keep auditioning, and I was like, oh my God, that's, I don't know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> so we just kept saying, and then we said, let's do open calls. And we would go down to the Fez, and we would never say what the race was, so we would have girls of color coming in, we'd have people of color, we had everybody coming in, and we learned so much about the role. And I remember, Christine, at some point, um, we were we got the money because these guys thank god gave us some money and we got you so we were finally on set we had everybody and, and you must remember this it was like we had an ad who quit and his girlfriend said he's been throwing up every day because his movie is not makeable and so and i said well nobody told me that but that was fine um and i remember you had said um i said to christine we don't have brandon and i've looked for three years we need that person, and we called Carrie, and I remember it was Carrie needs to pull out all the stops. We had looked at hundreds and hundreds of trans people and butches and everybody. We were just open, and then all the tapes were coming in, and it was kind of like each one was worse than the last. It was like you were just like exhausted, and then one day for me, this was my experience, a human being was on that screen, and we had never seen everything all at once. We were open to anybody, but all of a sudden that human being had a jawline and was androgynous and had the ears and had the forehead and had a kind of swagger and a, a kind of a sex appeal and smiled. 
that was the thing that hit me is that that person just charmed the screen and we brought that person in and were there eight of us in the room we were all there yeah. mm -hmm. and that person performed and it was just clear that this person we had been dreaming about i've been dreaming for five years the rest of you for probably four <laughs> the person was there and it was a, a miracle and i still said to christine what if the person and again the term pass is not something we'd use now but you would use then it wasn't derogatory the movie needed the person to pass as a man as much as the person passed as a man in life in order that all the other actors made sense. Because when I went to Sundance, I, I had somebody who did not pass as a man. And what ended up happening, if they didn't pass as a man, was there was no authenticity to the other actors. Right? Yeah. Then the, the Lana character was like looking at somebody and you're like, but that's a girl. So you needed that, that level of passingness and you needed the charm and the warmth, which all of you have. I mean, I have to say, all these actors, they have a, a need for love that's, that's really beautiful and warm. And I do believe that, that you watch the movie and I feel the love and the, the humor. Um, and that's as much as I know. Now I want to hear what you guys think of how we got the person. Um, like I said, I had auditions in LA because we were up against the wall, really. Yeah. And um, had loaded. pretty much the cast, and except for the lead. And Hillary came in during my lunch hour, and we worked probably for about an hour. And she had a cowboy hat on because she had this long Julia Roberts hair. And uh, she wouldn't take it off. She would not take her cowboy hat off. And we and worked and we smart. worked and we worked. It was very smart too because she's a gorgeous woman. You know? And um, and then I sent the tape over probably two day FedEx. <laughs> Saving money, yeah. And, uh, and then you guys watched it. You flew her here, I think, maybe? Or did you come out? I don't remember. No, it came here. Yeah. It, was, it definitely happened in yeah. New York. Yeah, but everybody was in the room. Yeah. And uh, she but worked again and worked again and worked we, again. I remember the tape arrived and we sat around in the office all day working, working, working. We didn't watch it till 10 o'clock at night yeah. in that little room at 380 Lafayette. And it was like, oh, God, that's the day that Carrie, okay, Carrie, Carrie gave us a day we're going to watch these people. And, we, and you and I just sat there and watched them. And then when Hillary walked on screen, it was like, oh, my God, and you freeze the frame. And I drew on it. I actually took lipstick and because I was trying to cover up, like create like a I was trying to create something on the screen. Maybe I did it at home. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think you did that. I did it at home. <laughs> in the office you sat there and we looked and said, Oh my god, that's him. Yeah. That's him. But you did give her a mandate. I don't know if you remember this or not, but well, you Hillary tell me what called you remember me. And I'll tell you Hillary called me and she said Kimberly says I have to go out and pass as a guy before she'll actually give me the job. <laughs> and she said um, and then she called me about a week later and she said, I passed. I called Kimberly. I told her some girl came up to me and thought I was a guy. <laughs> and she was like thrilled. She was over the moon. Yeah. Well, we knew that we wanted her to live as a, as a man as much as. And this was in LA in the coffee shop or something, I think. Yeah, we wanted this person to live as a man. We wanted it to be completely authentic. We all were so in love with the character and so committed. And we also wanted her to train. She worked out, you know, which meant. It wasn't about getting skinny, but it was about getting angular. It was like everything that I had learned from studying uh, trans and, and butch and, 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 and drag kinging, like what it was to actually be authentic. So we had her uh, do that. <coughs> Any other question? Sabrina. Hi. Oh, no. I got one. Hello? Hi. Oh, over here. Okay. <laughs> um, so you've talked a little bit about um, working with your actors on such um, kind of difficult, emotional, and vulnerable. Uh, you were in the class pattern. today. Yes, I was. Okay. I was in class earlier. Um, um, so you talked a little bit about the subject matter and how difficult it is. Not how difficult it is. Um, Just run sorry. With it. You'll, you'll formulate be a question here. here. Um, I'm really curious to hear about on set when you have all of this vulnerable energy and all of this um, tension from your actor from your actors um, when the scenes are actually happening. When you yell "cut," you know where what happens to that tension? Are you trying to keep it? Do you? I I, I don't know. I does that. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Is that basically a question? It, it, it's a really good question. I, first of all, I don't think that the actors bring a lot of tension to the set. No, no, that's not. No, no, and I'm not, I'm not being pejorative. I'm just saying, I think in fact the. Hopefully you've, you know, you've done all your blocking rehearsals. You've, 
you know, done really good location scouting, you've, everybody's practiced, you know, you've you worked with your co-writer, you've figured out what the scene's about, and hopefully, you know, you've done that so that when you come to the set, in fact, the energy can be very low among all of us, it's very calm, and then the actors, in fact, which is kind of miraculous to me, is when they emote, I always find, you're like, wow, it's so beautiful and rich, but, you know, some actors, you know, right when you call cut, it, they go back to being uh, just normal people, and sometimes they just keep to themselves, and every actor is different. Like, I recall Chloe never wanted to look at the monitor. I don't know if you, that is your experience, because I always say to the actor, if you want to look at the monitor, you can look at the monitor. If you don't, well, you don't have to. Do we have playback? I was going to say, yeah. we didn't have playback. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> What do I remember? We did not have playback. Oh, yeah, we never saw dailies. You're right. Okay, that's another movie. Um, yeah, we never saw dailies. Okay. You know, we had dailies about three days yeah. later, right. which was very quick back then. Yeah. But we didn't so see them. The, the, the film was yeah. shipped to New York. No, but, yeah. and then, but, but we had to go to a theater to see it, and we ne nobody had the energy. No, no we had, they were on beta camp. <laughs> There was Did a, I not yeah, get? We had a monitor. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once. I, I'm glad we're we're getting this worked yeah, out. I watched the dailies once. Oh, yeah. But because there was popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but in terms of, well. in terms of what you're saying about you know do you first of all you don't yell cut I think that the you no know, and that and I'm not yeah, yeah. I'm just saying I think what you try to do is just create an environment that's as friendly and as open and as well rehearsed as possible so everybody can do their best work and. And if, if anything, you know, sometimes also we do rolling takes, which I find. Yeah, quick resets. Yeah, don't you, I mean, most actors really say, right. can we do a series? Let's go, you know, we'll do one, two, three, four. And back then you had a, a film reel that would run out. Now you don't. So I find most actors really want you to just keep it calm and keep it going. And, you know, and if, even if you give them a small direction or something. Um, but maybe the actors can speak to that because it's really lucky we have them here. Or maybe Jim can speak right. to it. Well, the, the thing I was going to say, the smart thing, that I thought you did. Video Village was kind of much simpler than than it is now. There was a where, village. Yeah, right. There was no village. There were no chairs. There were no, like, it, it was like one little monitor on a stand. There was only one camera. And it was always in the room with the, you know. I was always with him Yeah, in the room she was, the like, we were never more than like, four feet apart. And that's, you know, and the actors were right there. It was, all, you know, it was, we were all in the same space. And I think that that's, that feels like a really important um, part of the process for you know for all of that, like being able to communicate without having to shout from the next room. Yeah, do that again, except better, you know, what, or whatever the direction is. That actually, um, I think, brings up the the power of the location, right? The just the remoteness of those locations, and we're all sitting out there, as you say, like in the kitchen or in the backyard, the patio, wherever we were, thinking like the barn, and it was so freezing and the conditions for <laughs> for a cast, right? No no heat warmers or anything like that. Um, but it really, when I watched Good it today. Good young and dumb. <laughs> young and dumb. <laughs> and cheap. We worked cheaply then, too. Question here? Yeah. Hi, Kim. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to all of you for making this film. Um, it's been 20 years since I saw it in the movie theater, and I saw it tonight as much as I did the first time I saw it, so <laughs> thanks a lot, Kim, again, for doing that, and to all of you. Um, and having known you also for so long, and, and being in my early 20s in New York in the queer scene, and also being part of a scene where people were sort of figuring this out, um, I feel so protective of the experience of seeing it 20 years ago and again today, and I recently read, um, I don't remember where, that when you had screened it at some school, there was a protest, um, or people respond now, I guess, to representations of, of trans people saying, well, why didn't you cast a trans person? And immediately when I hear that, I, I just get defensive because it was so important, and I think that's a, it's a testament to your film that it's now being put in the Library of Congress, that it, this is a culturally and historic important film. Uh, so I guess I have two questions. One is, how do you respond to the to the importance of this film's relevance today, even though so much has changed and what we expect of casting? And then two, having heard everyone say how much you researched this, why did you, what was it, how did you, you know, why was this so important for you to make? Because today, 20 years later, it it's still so important. Well, I'll answer the second question first, and then I welcome anybody else to jump in. Um, 
I think I've been telling stories since I was four years old. Um, I came, you know, we've been friends a long time. My parents were 15 when they had me, and I lived in a lot of different places, had a lot of ups and downs. Uh, learned to tell stories very early on uh, as a way of making sense of a life that had no order. Uh, and was very lucky, educated myself, went to University of Chicago, came here to Columbia. Was at Columbia, was learning all these great classics, was loving, you know, we had Scorsese teaching, we had Paul Schrader, we had just, you know, amazing people. And I could feel that I was learning how to tell stories in a really, really great way, but I also could feel a part of myself was not being answered. And I just started going down to the gay clubs. And to me, it was wild. It was kind of like, oh my God. I remember bicycling past the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival when Robin Vockel was running it and just thinking, oh my God, I might be like a bad gay. Like, maybe I'm gay, but I don't really know how to be gay and I'm not really be good at it. Anyway, so the point was, I was just kind of flush with my other, my identity coming to the fore. And I knew I wanted to tell a story about somebody who lived as a man. I was actually telling the story of a, a, a female-bodied person who was an eighth uh, of color, passed as white, passed as a man, and passed as a northerner in the Civil War. And my great professor here, Crane Jacker, said, you can't tell that story because that's the story of somebody who passes as a man because it's to survive. You want to tell the story of somebody who, if you, again, we, we said the word pass, but you would say live now, lives as a man because it's who they are. And I remember, I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I don't have a thesis now, <laughs> right? Because I, I don't have that story. But that was what Keats calls negative capability. Uh, live with the unknown and the, the uncertainty. And I was like unhappy for about three weeks. And then the movie God shone down. And, I, and all of a sudden, this person appeared in my life. I read the Village Voice article. And I literally felt I had been baptized in fire. And I, I was in love. And it was like a child had been put in my hands. and. It was the strangest thing. I just was obsessed. I felt like I needed to figure out who and what Brandon, who, who Brandon was and, and how he lived. Was he a trans? Was he a butch? Was he a this? Whatever he was. Try to, to, do, to bring him to life in a way that was authentic because I didn't want to recreate about this. I wanted to capture the power of his desire to shape himself into who he was because that was extraordinary. I also knew, knew that I needed to represent the violence, the stripping and the rape and the murder but I knew because of my own history of, and I'm out about all this, the physical and sexual abuse and all that stuff and, and all the therapy I've done, I didn't want to, I wasn't doing this for autobiographical reasons, I was doing it because I had an in in it and I wanted to represent it in a way that I said was not pornographic. I like pornography in my life, in my sex, I don't want it in my violence, right? So I don't want to create something that would make a human being be dishonored. Of course, I have a, a, an understanding of queer and all that, but. I don't want to see a black body or a female body or anybody, a, hu a human being destroyed. But if I want to put it on screen, how do I destroy that person in such a way that I create empathy? I don't undignify them. I don't encourage you as a human being to go assault somebody. Um, and I don't assault people who are viewing it. So when I read that story, and you said this, people often make good first films because they've had it in them for 20 years. And maybe Christine can take over because I think I really know, having been through Hollywood for many years and now done a lot of movies and a lot of TV, the amazing thing was nobody could have made this movie but Christine and the people that we assembled. It is true. And what I also realized is when I got to Hollywood, people were like, well, is there sexism? I was like, of course there's not sexism. If somebody like me could make it, well, there's a ton of sexism. But I think having a powerful female at the helm, we didn't have an issue over me being a powerful woman. And I think every day, and nor did I have it with Carrie Barton, nor did I have it with you. We've assembled the greatest men and women on the, I mean, the, these guys were, everybody was great. There was no power dynamics around that. When I got to Hollywood, there was a lot of those kind of power dynamics. So I was madly in love and I was at the right time in the right place because it was, as Paul Schrader said, he was my professor. My next two movies are very personal. And he said, you have such good family stories, but you need years and years and years. And he said, Brandon Tina, Paul Schrader made uh, Taxi Driver. And he said of Taxi Driver that Travis Bickle was uh, driving in a moving coffin. And when he said that, my brain just kind of exploded because I was like, wow, that's so smart. And he said that Brandon Tina was the perfect transformation for me because it was a version of myself, but it was not me, right? It was a dramatic version. So I think that Boys was just the greatest calling in the world. And I said this earlier, I was a kid. I had been through one year of film school. I didn't know anything. I hadn't made a movie. Um, I mean, I knew a lot about life. And I think I said to myself, I, I have to be a good writer and director to serve the movie. I'm not good enough. And not in an erotic way, but in a, 
I just, I have to do this right. And I remember we thought if we even film it, that's amazing. We didn't think we would. Then we were like, well, if we make it and it shows at the two boots and you eat a piece of pizza, like that's okay. And I remember Christine came to me after we made it, all these different things. And she was like, you're gonna have to do press. And I was like, what's that? And she showed me a book like this. And she was like, Todd Haynes does this and you should never turn down an interview. And I was like, okay. So anything Christine told me to do, I would do. I don't think I've ever turned down an interview. It's been 500,000 interviews. Like, when I remember when we got nominated for a Golden Globe, I was like, what's a Golden Globe? Like, I didn't watch the Oscars. I didn't know a lot, which was fine. I think I just was so in love with a story and I've always been a storyteller and the story found me. And then I got the greatest team in the world. I know that. Very lucky. But somebody else shouldn't. <laughs> I don't really have much more to add to that. I mean, you know, uh, and we're probably, are, are we sort of at the, we're sort of at the end. Yeah, I see the, um, you know, the one thing I wanted to, to add just, and it's, it's a little bit of an aside, but we were talking about, um, about Hillary and the actors, and I'm sort of curious about this with, with Chloe and, Brand, uh, and Brandon here. Um, one of the really sort of extraordinary things of, about Hillary, I thought, and about her relationship with you guys, was you guys all sort of knew each other a little bit already. You were New York actors. And I remember Hillary showing up on set that first day and saying, like, she showed up with her dog, and she said, can I put my dog in the trailer? And I was like, oh, honey. <laughs> and you guys were all like, a trailer? She thinks we have a trailer. <laughs> and uh, anyway, this is to end on a note of levity. That was, uh, uh, I was like, yeah, that dog's not going in a trailer because there are none. And she was like, oh. <laughs> and um, but it was great because it sort of was like, you know, it was Brandon against the world. <laughs> <laughs>